Hello, how is everybody doing tonight? Can everybody hear me okay and see my screen all right? All right, thank you, Clive. Uh, we're going to wait just a couple minutes and uh, let everybody get here, and uh, then we'll be getting started. I'm, um, I'm going to enter in the website address here um, for the third uh, ebook guide in case you uh, did not receive that already. Okay, hey, um, I'll go ahead and get started here, guys. I've got uh, quite a bit to cover tonight, um, probably more than I've had any of the previous weeks to cover. Um, so I am going to try to move a little quickly through this, but you know, if you, if you see or hear something and you have some questions, feel free to just ask them at any time and uh, you know, I'll stop what I'm doing and and answer those for you guys, and and if not, then I'll you know I'll, I'll take some time towards the end to uh, to stop uh, to ask you guys some questions. Then, um, let me go ahead and uh, pull up a web page here. Now, um, tonight we're going to be talking about CSS. Um, and, and before I actually get into um, teaching CSS to you guys, uh, the, the first thing that I want to talk to you about is actually how to uh, use the CSS coding on, on your websites. Um, because there's, there's a couple different ways that this can be done, and depending on how it is done, um, there can be certain advantages or disadvantages to each of these uh, particular methods. So I really just wanted to take a few minutes uh, to start with and explain each of these methods to you guys and show you how they work so you can understand um, all the different methods that can be used and be able to make the correct decision to decide what to use for uh, for your own your own pages. Um, now, on 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 previous uh, occasions when I've been teaching you guys some things, um, I have briefly dipped into uh, CSS coding before. Um, now, all the CSS CSS coding that I've shown you so far, it's all been what's known as uh, inline CSS coding. And this basically just means that whenever you have an HTML tag that you are wanting to apply some CSS code to, you are simply adding that CSS coding to the specific tag that you would like to alter. Um, just to show you a quick example of how this works, in case you uh, don't remember it from the previous times, um, I'm just going to make a a simple HTML link real quick to start with and uh, and then I'm going to add some CSS coding to it to show you how it works now here is a standard HTML link like I have shown you guys uh, before now all you have to do to add inline CSS coding to it is to simply use the style attribute within your tag now you add an equal sign and uh, double quotes after your uh, attribute and then everything that goes in between these quotes right here is going to be your CSS coding. So whatever whatever CSS code you want to use to alter this particular um, tag here you can all you have to do is enter it in and it will automatically 
uh, alter the uh, the HTML tag that you have added this inline coding to. Now, the advantages of this is uh, it's obviously simple and straightforward. The code is applying to uh, you know the tag that it is sitting within. So when you're just looking at your coding, it makes it a lot easier uh, to quickly understand what it is that you have going on here. Um, and as you can see, like I made this one change the text color and I turned it into bold text, um, all just from adding a couple of simple lines of CSS coding. Now we'll get into um, actually explaining this to you guys in more detail later. Um, my intention right now is to simply explain the different methods of how you can use this coding. Um, so any any other method besides the inline method that you want to use, um, you actually have to uh, take that CSS coding and put it somewhere else. Um, so I'm actually going to go ahead and copy this coding and I'm going to remove it from this tag and then I will uh, proceed to the next method so I can show you guys uh, the alternative for having your inline coding. Now, what I'm going to do next is to use an HTML tag by the name of style, and you add the type attribute to it, and the value that it receives should be text forward slash CSS, and all this is doing, it is, it is uh, creating an HTML tag, and you're telling the web browser that any information in between these two style tags is going to be CSS coding. Now, this can be done directly on the same page here, uh, like you see me doing it now, or it can also be done um, within your theme, for example. You could add this coding uh, to the header file of your theme. Now, I'll show you guys that in just a few minutes when I go on to do the uh, next method, but just for simplicity's sake, I would like to keep all of this in the same window here for you guys um, so you can actually see what I'm doing and how it's affecting uh, my HTML coding that I have in place. So um, the biggest difference between using inline CSS coding and any of the other methods is that you have to uh, include an identifier with your CSS coding when you're not using inline CSS code. Now the reason for that is because if you just simply type in CSS coding up here, the, the browser does not know where to apply this CSS coding within the content of your page. So the purpose of the identifier is to let the browser know exactly what this CSS coding should be altering. Now, there are a few different um, identifiers, and I will actually get into explaining these identifiers a little bit more um, later in this lesson in more detail. But uh, for now, what I'm going to do is just simply give you a brief example of how this works. Now, I have taken my CSS coding that I had as my inline coding, and I have pasted it into uh, my style tag up here. Now the, the identifier that I have assigned to this is the identifier of A. Now what this means is that this is a representative of an HTML tag by the same name. So within the content of my page, all of my links are going to get altered using this CSS coding. And you might have noticed I have a, uh, a little curly bracket here to open this up and another one at the end to close it. These are very important. Um, any coding that is within the two curly brackets will be the coding that is applied to this identifier. So uh, updating this example and then going and looking at the changes that it has made to my site, um, there really aren't going to be uh, 
much in the way of changes here. Now, as you can see, um, this has actually made my um, link text bold, but uh, the color that I had previously applied to it is actually not getting applied to my link. And there's a really good reason for why this is happening. Now, if you're, if you're just building um, a web page completely from scratch, you won't run into problems like this. But when you're using uh, WordPress, you can easily run into problems where your CSS coding doesn't work as you're expecting it to work. And the reason for this um, is actually because of the theme that you are using on the site. Sometimes the themes will have uh, very generalized CSS coding within them that will actually alter um, the way particular uh, elements on your page will appear. So uh, for that reason is, is actually one good example. You cannot read it too small. Are you talking about the coding here on the page, Stan? Let's see if I can make that bigger. Increase my text size a little. Does that help out? It might distort the way some of the things on my page end up looking as a result, but um, you know if it if it helps to be able to uh, to read what I'm typing in here, then then uh, that's okay with me. Um, now I was talking about the uh, the uh, text link color before. This is one particular example where you may find that it is uh, simply easier to use the inline coding. And the reason for this is because when, when a browser is reading all of the content on your page and they're looking at your CSS coding, there, there is a particular order um, that that is being done in. Um, as you can see, when I added this style back in as inline coding, it actually changed it on the page, whereas when I was using it up here in the HTML tag, um, it did not change it. The reason for that is because of the ordering like I was talking about before. First, uh, it will look and, you know, it'll look at the HTML tag, it'll look at the, the meta tag, which is the method that I'll be discussing next. Um, but the, the absolute last uh, part that it looks at will be the inline CSS coding. So if you have coding that is altering your elements in a way that you don't want them to, and you can't figure out a way to get that to change, you can add your inline CSS coding directly to your HTML tags and force those changes upon it. Now, depending on the order that uh, things the uh, CSS coding is read on your page, um, sometimes you can force that change by adding this extra tag to the end of your value. You add a space, um, an exclamation point, and then the word important. And this is simply telling CSS that this particular style is important and you don't want it to um, be wiped out elsewhere. Now as you can see, when I set this to be important, it finally uh, realized what I wanted to be done on this page. And as you can see, since I used a generalized um, link reference right here, it is actually forcing all the other links on my site to change their color as well. Um, so once again, you can see that using this important tag right here um, can sometimes mean the difference between whether your code takes effect or not. Um, and once again, this is really only something you have to worry about um, on WordPress sites. When there is CSS coding that is already in place on the site, and you may not be aware of what that CSS coding is or exactly what it is doing. Um, so this is a way to tell CSS that uh, 
it needs to ignore the other rules and it needs to simply pay attention to this one and not overwrite it with um, another CSS rule later on. Oh, your machine's gone loco, Stan. <laughs> Which, um, are you referring to the ebook guide link, Stan? Looks like the link pulls up okay for me. The one that's in the um, in the chat box, at least. Um, now, moving on to the uh, to the next method. Um, this is actually using what is called a meta tag. Now, uh, the way you go about doing this is is slightly more complicated, um, but it is considered the uh, the cleanest way to include a, uh, CSS coding on your websites because it keeps all of your CSS coding off of the actual page. And you are simply creating a standalone file with that CSS coding in it. Um, and the way you do that is uh, everything that is between your tags, your style tags right here, this would actually be the content that goes in that standalone uh, CSS file. And then depending on the way, depending on, I guess, the theme that you are using, um, there could be different ways that you actually go about adding in um, the meta tag to call that CSS file that you have created. Um, now, I use the Weaver theme for most of my websites. Um, so if you, if you are using this particular theme, um, you can see that um, right here under Advanced Options in the Weaver 2 Admin, um, they provide some text boxes right here where you can actually enter in uh, your own custom coding that will be added to the header tag, for example, uh, anything that you punch into this first box. You might also notice a little further down um, that there is actually a place for custom CSS rules down here as well. Now, the same thing works here. What this uh, text box is actually asking you for is not the entire CSS code. It wants just the CSS code that you would be entering into um, a standalone file. You can actually copy this coding right here and simply punch it in to this custom CSS rules box to get that to work. Um, but then again, you know, I'm, I'm I would like to show you uh, the other method of actually loading this in through the header tag and using a standalone CSS file to do this. Um, now all you have to do is, is uh, use an HTML tag called link and you set the attribute of rel to a value of style sheet and this simply tells um, the browser what kind of file you are trying uh, to load here. Now, I have not created a standalone um, CSS file for this particular tutorial, um, but what I am going to do is actually show you guys how you would go about calling a customized CSS file. Now, all you would really need to do to create one of these, if you wanted to use this method, um, you can simply open up uh, Notepad, for example. You create your text file with all of your CSS coding in it, and then you uh, save that file. Don't save it as a text file, but save it as a file with a .css ending to it. And then you can simply upload that file to your website, and then within the href tag or attribute of your link tag here, you simply punch in the full uh, website address to access that tag. Now, there are a couple more attributes that are required. Just like my style tag, I also need 
this uh, type attribute set on this link tag. And I also um, am going to be using an attribute called media right here. Now, media is actually telling the browser um, when to use this particular style sheet. This is one of the advantages to using this particular method over the other methods. Um, because when you're simply loading um, CSS coding as inline coding, um, you don't get to differentiate between uh, whether you want to use one group of code or another group of code depending on who, uh, who is actually viewing your website. Um, so this media tag uh, attribute right here, you can change the value to actually target a specific uh, type of device that is accessing your web page. Um, so you can you could build numerous CSS files that would completely change the way your website looks depending on who is looking at your website. Now in the um, in the guidebook for tonight's lesson, I actually listed out uh, the different values that you could use here, but the most common ones of those, um, all is obviously going to affect all of the different possible devices. If you don't want to take the time to create separate CSS files for each, just simply use the all value here, and it's not something that you will have to worry about. But if you do want to take the time, um, for uh, desktop computers, for example, you would set your value to screen, S-C-R-E-E-N. Um, and then you could have a, another CSS file that is loaded up for your mobile visitors, for example. And for that, you would use a value of handheld, H-A-N-D-H-E-L-D. Um, and there are a number of different other types. Those will be your two most common. You also have a media value of print, which will affect when people are trying to print the content off of your website. So you could actually create uh, one web page and then have different CSS files that will completely change the way that it looks depending on who is visiting your site. Now obviously this is a little more complicated, something that you might not get into um, you know, until further down the road when you get more comfortable using CSS, but I, I at least wanted to make you guys aware of um, this this uh, feature and possibility that exists for uh, your CSS coding because it is it is one of the reasons why some people will choose to load up their CSS files through this meta tag instead of using uh, either of the other two techniques that I was showing you before. Um, so. This is, uh, this is my complete HTML tag right here, which will load the CSS file. You can use this exact tag on your own websites. All you would really need to do is simply replace the uh, website address here with the website address of your own CSS file that you would like to load. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, start moving on to some of the uh, the basics for you guys um, because I do have quite a bit that I uh, am looking to cover tonight. Um, so I'm going to jump on back to this previous page here and go ahead and set this link back up how I had it before. Now, um, The uh, the first thing that I need to talk to talk about in terms of using CSS coding um, is going to be the the syntax. Now, if um, if you're familiar with this, um, you know obviously you might uh, not get a lot of use out of the next couple of minutes. But this is this is something very essential that I need to explain just to make sure that everybody. Um, does understand this before I proceed. Now, within your CSS coding, 
you have a series of commands and values that you're using to tell uh, the browser what you would like to do. Now, your CSS command is uh, at the beginning here, and the uh, separator between your command and your value is a colon. And after that is uh, the value for the command that you have entered. And then it is very, very important to make sure you close all of your values off with a semicolon. Now the semicolon, it's not necessarily indicating that you are closing uh, the value of your previous command, but the semicolon is more used as a separator between two commands. This is saying to stop the value and to start listening for another command to come in. Without uh, a separator here, you would simply have all of this trying to be assigned as the value for your CSS command. So the separator is very, very important. Now, when you're um, doing a string of commands and values, at the very, very end, you could technically leave off the very last semicolon separator. However, um, I really recommend to just make a habit of using it every single time, even if there's only one command, because if you decide later to uh, revisit your code and to add something extra to it, you may end up uh, just simply typing from the end of your line and forget about um, the fact that you didn't have a closing semicolon um, on there from the last time, and then you know you end up with with problems as a result. And sometimes it may not stand out exactly what you had done wrong that caused the problem. So uh, for this reason, I I always recommend that people use um, the semicolon even even if it is their last CSS command in a particular string of commands. Um, now the, the next thing that I need to talk to you about are the identifiers that I had mentioned to you before. When I am using uh, simply the standalone uh, HTML tag method, can add this back in right here, um, the A right here was my identifier. Now I had mentioned to you guys before that this, this A is actually in reference to an HTML tag, so I could use uh, the name of an HTML tag here as the identifier. Um, any any HTML tag that I want altered on my page, I simply use that identifier right here, and it will alter it. So if I wanted to alter uh, tables, I could just punch in the table identifier. If I wanted to alter uh, anything within a div HTML tag, I just simply type in the word div. If I wanted to alter the entire web page, let's say I wanted to set a new font size for my web page, for example, you could simply use the HTML tag body as an identifier. And this will affect everything within the body HTML tags on your page, which um, if you're not familiar with it, that's actually all of the viewable content on your entire page. So um, this, is, this is a really easy way to cast some generalized uh, CSS coding over your entire website. If you, uh, you know, let's say you wanted to be altering HTML links, if you were using inline CSS coding and you wanted to do the same exact thing to every link on your page, you would have to go through and copy and paste this style along with all your CSS coding into every single link on your page. Now obviously, since the actual CSS coding of it would be uh, the same on all those different links, um, you're actually creating a bunch of what's known as code bloat when you're doing this. Um, and then the reason why is because instead of repeating the same uh, 
amount of code over and over and over again, you can actually consolidate that into simply one line of code and then use an identifier to apply that code to all of those different tags instead of punching them all in individually. Now, beyond using HTML tags as an identifier, there are actually two other methods that you can use. Um, the first one of those is by using an ID identifier. Now, ID is actually an attribute that you can set on HTML tags. Um, but it is very important to remember that whatever value you assign as the ID for an HTML tag, it can only be used one time throughout your entire page. You want to make sure that you don't repeat this because it can cause errors. Um, so just uh, to give you an example, I could call this one, I could give it an ID name of RSP link. Um, now when I want to reference this particular link, let's say I don't want to apply this CSS coding to all of the links on my page. Let's say I only want to apply it to this one link, but maybe I don't want to use the inline CSS coding. Um, to do that, I need to reference this ID right here in my CSS coding. Now when you want to reference an ID, you simply use the number symbol and then you type in the name of the ID. So this would simply be RSP link. Just like I was doing with the A HTML tag, I simply use the ID value down here and add the number symbol in front of it. And now this code will affect only this one link on my page. So now the, the other method um, is using a class identifier. Uh, now the difference between an ID and a class is that a, a class is simply used for uh, CSS coding purposes typically. And while the ID attribute can only be used once on a page, you can actually use the class, uh, the same name of the class attribute multiple times on a page. So I could actually have two, or three, four links uh, that were all using this same class right here. And to reference that, all I do is simply use a period instead of a number symbol. The period references a class and the number symbol references an ID. So now with this example, this, H, this uh, CSS coding will affect all of these links, but instead of affecting all of the links throughout my entire page, it's only going to affect the ones that I have flagged with this particular class attribute. So now this will not alter all of the links on the page. It will only alter these links on the page. So using the class identifier is a way that you can target multiple elements with one uh, bit of CSS coding um, and, and still keep the control of not applying that CSS coding to all of the HTML tags on your page by the same name. Um, so these are, these are the basic identifiers that you can use, but then you can still go a step beyond that and um, actually combine these identifiers into one single line and um, it, it really just makes it easier to actually reference the exact elements that you want to reference with your CSS coding. Um, using this example, I I have placed all of my um, links here within a div tag, for example. So let's say I had multiple links on my page. Maybe they all have this particular class on them, but maybe I only want to alter the links that are actually within this div tag right here. Now, to accomplish that, I could actually just add the identifier div right before um, my class here. 
and you can use a space or not use a space. Um, it will actually still process the same way. And so this line right here, div.rsp link, will, it will not affect this link right here, but it will affect all four of these links in here because all of these are children of a div tag. Now, obviously on a WordPress site, I might have more than one div tag available. Um, so if I needed to make reference to a specific div tag, for example, I could simply add an ID to this div tag and then change my identifier up here to reference the, uh, the div ID of uh, this tag right here. So now this line of code right here will guaranteed only affect these four links throughout my entire page and no other links. Um, now you can even go yet another step further with this. Let's say you had um, more than one type of link on your page or more than one element on your page, for example, that you wanted to apply uh, a particular set of CSS rules to. A way that you could accomplish this, so let's say you wanted to apply this color and this bold um, to not only these links, but maybe to any content found within tables as well. You could simply add in a comma right here and then add in another identifier. You can add as many identifiers as you want to within one single line of CSS coding, as long as you keep separating each identifier with a comma. So using this method, you can really, really consolidate your CSS coding and literally make it to where you don't ever repeat the same CSS coding on your page because you could simply uh, consolidate things to only apply to the proper elements that you want them to and do it all using a, a series of identifiers. Um, so there, there are really no limits to uh, how extensively this can be used. Um, which, which can make it a little confusing to try to use it the first time, but uh, once you get familiar with it, it, it definitely uh, opens up your, your possibilities. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, and move on and uh, start talking about some actual CSS commands uh, for you guys now. Um, the first ones that I'm going to talk about are going to be commands that can alter uh, text that you have on your page. Now, I'm going to start out here with uh, just simply a div tag, for example, uh, just to change this up a little for you guys so I'm not doing the same example over and over again for you. Um, you could simply add your your content into this div tag and then if you wanted to change the way that the text looked by default, you simply add that in with your style attribute. Now the first uh, command that I would like to talk about is to change your text size. This is uh, pretty simple and straightforward. You just use the command font size Make sure you use a colon as your separator. And then you simply enter in uh, the size of the text that you would like. Now, this text can be measured in a number of different ways. Um, one of the easiest to understand, uh, in my opinion, is pixels. 16 pixels is typically the default text size value um, on a web page. So if you would like your text larger, simply pick a number larger than that. If you want it smaller, simply pick a number smaller than that. As you can see, I've set this to a font size of 18 pixels. Pixels are represented by just the letters PX as an abbreviation. Um, so by simply adding that one little bit of CSS coding onto it, I actually change the uh, 
the size of the content that would be contained within this particular tag. So if I go back to my page and refresh the changes, you can see that my content right here, uh, the text size has gotten larger than the surrounding text sizes. Um, the next command that I would like to teach you is font weight. Now, if you remember from last week, I was teaching you HTML tags uh, B and strong that can both be used to make text display uh, bold, but you can also use CSS to accomplish this. Um, and actually, CSS gives you even more control over your text in this manner than the HTML tags do. So I could simply set my font weight command to a value of bold, and uh, it will make my text appear bold now. If I refresh the changes, you can see that uh, the text is showing up bold. Now, I can also, uh, you know, if, if you had content within your page, and let's say you wanted to make some of it bold, but then other parts of it you didn't want to be bold, you could actually clear uh, that bold by setting a font weight of normal. So then I'll add some additional content here into this tag and update my changes. And you can see that now, even though this content right here, even though it is located within the div tag that is being made bold, I have forced it to change by adding uh, in another CSS command and embedding it within another HTML tag to change the rules of how this text is displayed. Um, but in, a, in addition to using just these uh, normal and bold values, you can actually set values um, based on a number. And these numbers go from the number 100 all the way up to the number 900. Um, but you, you need to use increments of 100. So you have 100, 200, 300, 400, and so on. Now, a value of 700 will produce the same effect as um, your bold command. And a value of 400 will produce the same effect as the normal command. So you can actually... Uh, set font weights that are heavier or, or lighter than the standard uh, normal or bold weights that are available. Make sure this updated real quick. I go back and refresh my page, you can see that this bold content here got even bolder than it was before. So CSS gives you these possibilities of not being forced to use one or the other, but you can actually use a series of increments in between a lot of times when you're using CSS coding. Now, the next thing that I want to talk to you about is using fonts. Um, now, there, there are a bunch of different ways that this can be done, but I really wanted to try to uh, simplify this for you guys and so in, in the guidebook, I have actually provided you um, a list of different uh, font combinations that you can use uh, with your text. All you have to do is simply use the command font family, and then you simply add the value um, from one of the examples uh, in the list that I have given you guys in the guidebook here. Now I'm going to paste in one of these here to uh, show you how this works. As you can see, uh, this value is actually kind of long and it has a couple different parts to it. Each portion of this value represents a different font. Um, but then Sometimes uh, some browsers may not actually be able 
to display every possible font type that is out there. So what this font family command is used for is to not only declare the default font that should be used, but then it is also declaring fallback fonts to use if the uh, first one is not available. So it will attempt to use this font right here, and if that's not available, then it'll move on down the line to this one and then to this one. So what I have done is to uh, provide a series of similar fonts uh, that could be used as a fallback for one another. So this should still hopefully give you the desired look you're looking to achieve with your font, um, but then give you the flexibility of not having to worry about whether it's going to work on this browser or that browser. Um, so when I, when I update the uh, font family here and go back to my page and refresh the changes, um, you can't tell a major difference, but the uh, the T's uh, in this particular font have a lot more curve to them um, than the previous font did. Some of these have some subtle differences. Others are uh, drastically different looking. Um, so I really kind of just encourage you guys, there's, there's only, I want to say maybe 10, 10 to 12 or so different font family lists that I've provided for you guys. Just go through and try out each of them just to get familiar with them. Um, and so then when you're wanting to change the fonts on your site, um, you know, you can already be a little bit familiar with how they're going to look and be able to pick the correct one for your situation. Um, now the next uh, command that I want to talk about will change uh, the style of the font. The command is called font style. But then what this is actually doing is it is the same thing as the I or EM tags in HTML that make text uh, italic. But just like the uh, example that I provided with bold, um, the font style also offers um, some extra options here that were not available in HTML. Now there are not as many options uh, this time around as there were with the bold command. Um, there are not different numbers that I can increment to create um, degrees of changes within that style, but um, I at least have one additional step beyond what HTML would allow me to do. Now, uh, just like with the font weight, if I want to remove the italic style from font, all I do is set the font style to normal. Um, when you want to make your text italic, you use the value of italic but then you can also use another value that was not available in HTML, and this is for oblique. And oblique is actually the same thing as italics, but it is more um, slanted. It's, it's more of an unsupported slant than the italics um, slant is. So once again, this is just another degree of extra customizability that you can use beyond what is available uh, using simple HTML commands. Now the next command that I would like to show you is for font variant. Now this works the same way. If you want to remove this effect, you simply use the value of normal. But um, I am going to be using it to change my text into small capital letters. Small caps, um, as you can see in, in this content right here, I already have one letter that is a real capital letter, and then the remaining letters are all lowercase letters. So what small caps does is it actually converts all of my lowercase letters into capital letters, but they are smaller capital letters. So it still appears as though uh, my word might actually be capitalized even though they're all capital letters. You can see all the uh, letters here, they have the same height except for C, it's actually going just a little bit higher than my other letters there. 
So, um, you know, even though you are setting small caps, there is still a difference between your lowercase letters and your capital letters and how they will um, display within your content. Um, the next thing that I would like to talk about is um, if you remember from last week, I was uh, discussing uh, lists with you guys. I actually would like to show you now how you can use CSS to change um, the, uh, the actual marker that is used with the list items. Now, to start with, um, you can use the, uh, the standard um, predefined list markers that are available. I actually made another list of these in the guidebook for you guys. Um, it doesn't include every single marker that is available, but it includes the most commonly used and the most commonly supported because not all of the markers are supported in all of the browsers. But this particular list that I've provided you guys, you should find that these will work uh, pretty much anywhere you would like to use them. So uh, I'm going to create a quick list here so I can show you how this works. This is going to be an ordered list. Um, I'm going to go ahead and update this and refresh my page so you can see what the list is going to look like by default. Now, by default, it numbers it using uh, standard American numbers. But there are, there are other forms of an ordered list that you can use by simply setting uh, some CSS coding. Use the command list style type to uh, make this change. And the value can be any one of the values that I have provided in uh, the guidebook for you guys. Now, I'm going to use um, the value of upper Roman here. And what this is going to do is actually change the numbers on my page into Roman numerals. And these are actually capital Roman numerals because um, there is also a lower Roman setting where it will uh, change everything to lowercase Roman numerals, for example. So by simply adding this one CSS attribute in here, um, you can completely change the way a list gets displayed. Now, another option, uh, instead of using one of the default markers, that is available for you, you can actually create um, your own customized marker. And you use this uh, with the command list style. You just simply remove the word type off from the end of it. Um, and now on list style, you can actually declare a website address of an image file that will be used as your marker instead of using um, one of the default CSS markers. Um, now when you're doing this, not only can you provide the URL, but you can still provide a list style type value to start with um, to use as a fallback in case the image cannot be loaded. Now, if you remember me talking uh, about the difference between using single quote marks and double quote marks, I mentioned that I like to use the double quote marks in my HTML coding so that when I use um, PHP or CSS coding along with it, then I can use single quote marks and they will not interfere with each other. This is um, one of those exact circumstances that I was referring to. Um, because as you can see here, in the value for list style, um, by, uh, to declare my website address for my image file, I start with the value of URL, and then I put an open parentheses, 
and then I have to have quote marks. These could technically be double quote marks, but the only problem is that if I were to use double quote marks here, then when all of this is getting rendered, uh, it would go right here, it would see an opening quote mark here, and then it would find the closing quote mark right here. And it would think that right here was my CSS coding, and it would think this is the end of it. And then it would uh, obviously encounter a problem trying to process the rest of this as um, an attribute for this HTML tag. So using the wrong quotes here can cause some major issues. So I always use the double quotes on my HTML and single quotes with my CSS coding. So this way I can mix and match them and not have to worry about encountering problems. So what I have done here is to simply declare the image file that I want to be used for my list. If I uh, go back here and refresh my page, you can see that this custom image file that I have set up is actually being used. Um, now, these image files, you could, they could be small, they could be larger. Um, it, it can really just be done with anything you want uh, to create any kind of a a look that you want to achieve. A lot of people don't realize it, but like on on WordPress, the uh, the menus that are right here on your home page, these menus are actually created using HTML list. And instead of using a marker with them, um, they don't use any markers at all. And instead of taking up a new line for each list, they simply drop right next to each other. Um, so if you if you were to actually view the source code of this page, you would see that right here, this menu is actually a list just like this is. It just simply uses CSS coding to change the way that it looks. Um, now the next thing that I would like to talk about um, beyond uh, changing the way your your text looks um, is I actually want to teach you how to lay out size and position uh, different HTML tags on your page. Now, I had, I had briefly gone through all of this, uh, well, at least some of these uh, commands here in the um, initial uh, freebie class that I had offered. So I'm probably going to try to skip through these a little quicker than I would normally um, in the uh, in the email that went out an hour before tonight's session started um, all the way at the bottom of it there was a link in it uh, to watch that particular video so if you do have any questions feel free to go back and and uh, take a look at that um, now I'm using the height and width uh, commands here and I'm setting a value in pixels to represent how large or small I want this particular um, HTML tag to be. Now, as you mentioned, as I uh, had talked to you last week about um, the difference between block um, and inline tags, uh, the div tag is a block tag. It will automatically attempt to take up all of the available horizontal space on my page. So I use CSS commands to change that default behavior and now I'm telling it that I only want for it to be a particular size. So now when I refresh my page here, it's going to take a minute, <laughs> um, you'll get to see that this content area is going to be expand to 250 by 250 pixels. Um, now it is kind of hard to actually tell that that is happening, but if you remember before, there was not this much white space down below um, my HTML tag. Now this will get a little bit clearer as I progress through um, 
some of these things and showing you guys how this stuff actually uh, works and, and how everything lines up. Um, now the, the next part is um, to add a float onto a div tag. Now when you're adding a float onto it, you are removing the tag from being a block element and you are forcing it to be an inline element, but you must have, uh, at the very least, you must specify a width to be able to use float correctly because otherwise your tag will be trying to take up all of the available space on the page. So now if I simply duplicate this, I will have two boxes that are 250 pixels by 250 pixels, and they will both try to um, sit on the same line with each other as long as there is enough horizontal space for them to do so. One of them will align to the left-hand side of the page, and the other one, other one will align also to the left-hand side of the page, but only as far as it can go before it butts into uh, my first element here. So now if I refresh uh, the changes on this page, you will get to see that uh, another content is going to appear out here to the side. I guess my internet's running a little slow tonight. Doesn't usually take this long. Here we go. Uh, you can see I have content here and I have content out here to the side. So I've essentially created a second column um, for myself. And I could continue to do this even more so um, just depending on how large my elements are and how much available space I have in my page to work with. Now. Um, to go a little bit beyond this, what I would actually like to do is uh, duplicate these content containers one more time here. Now I'll go ahead and add on a number uh, to the end of each of these so you guys can easily tell where these are showing up on my page. So now what I'm going to do this time around is I'm going to add another um, div tag outside of all of these other tags. And I am adding this extra div tag here as a placeholder and it also um, is defining my available space on the page. So I have set this to be 500 pixels and each of these boxes are 250 by 250 pixels. So I'm actually gonna set the height to 500 pixels as well to ensure that this tag will actually make enough room for all of these elements to fit in it. Um, and instead of having a series of one, two, three, four going across the page from left to right, because of the size of the parent element and the size of the children elements, um, you will actually see that they will stack up inside of that element. You should have one, two, and three, four down below it instead of all of them stretching across the page. And the reason why this happens is because of the sizes that I have defined here. So if you wanted to create a multi-column, see I have a one, two, and three, four. If you wanted to have more going across, you simply leave enough room for them to stretch out and set the sizes accordingly so they will all fit. And then when there is not enough space left, for another element to show up beside it, then it will automatically drop it down to a new line like it has done here. Even though within the actual content here, uh, I have not told it to start dropping down to a new line. All of these are floating left. Um, so it simply drops to a new line when it runs out of space that it can work with. Now, when you are doing something like this um, and floating uh, elements on your page, it is very, very important to make sure that you clear your floats. 
Um, now to show you how this actually ends up working, I am going to, I have this, uh, this one float, floated uh, div tag right here, and I'm going to add in some additional content directly beside it. Now, without this float attribute here, um, this content and this content would be showing up on two completely different lines. But because I have not cleared my float after using it, then that float is actually still in place, and you can see that I actually end up with the same results that I did the first time around. It still looks like this content right here is set to float, even though it's just standing out here all by itself. Now, the way you fix this is, as I was saying before, you clear your float. You use the CSS command clear, and uh, just out of a habit, I actually end up clearing both of the floats, um, even if I have just used one of them, just simply because I typically don't find myself needing to clear one float or the other. I'm usually looking to use my floats, and then when I'm done with them, then I clear them out. Um, so I do this by creating a div tag, which is actually blank. There's no content within this div tag. And all I'm doing is setting the CSS style of clear and a value of both um, for this particular tag. And when I do this, it is then telling uh, the page that I don't want uh, my elements to be in line and floating anymore. I want to clear those floats, and I want everything to return to normal, how it should usually be. So as you can see, by adding in the cleared float, then I have forced... Uh, the next line to actually drop down to a new line like it is supposed to. Um, now the next um, the next command that I would like to teach I I uh, believe everything that I've taught so far um, with this uh, uh, layout and sizing and positioning I'm pretty sure I've already discussed all of these commands before now. Um, but now I'm about to break into um, some commands that I have not discussed with you before. And this is actually uh, the position command, the first one that I would like to talk about. Um, now, the position command, it is used to alter the standard um way of displaying elements on your page. Where do you find pix, pixel count for your web page? Are you ref you're referring to like for um, just just the total size of of your um, of like the uh, the content area like here? Like how would you find out how wide this area is? Um, okay. That could actually be done uh, by using CSS coding. You could actually view the source code of the page and then uh, simply go and find uh, the CSS coding that is controlling this portion of your page. Um, but that can actually be a little complicated for for most people to do um, depending on what theme you are using sometimes your theme may offer you a way to um, change that content area um, and others do not so there there really may not be an easy question to this um, instead of hunting through a bunch of different code uh, one of the things that you can do is to actually just create a quick HTML element within your page. Uh, take a guess at what you think the total width of your content area may be. So I will guess 650 pixels for this one. And then I'm going to set a, uh, a border 
on this element. So I can actually see how large it is. And then I will refresh my page and you can see that this is almost taking up all of my available space here. Um, you need to pay attention to the margin that is over here on the left because chances are that margin also exists here on the right. So um, it looks like I may have actually guessed perfectly. There, there, may be, there may be 10 more pixels worth of content space um, in this particular theme that I use. Um, but for, for most WordPress themes, um, six, 600 to 650, I think, is probably going to be fairly standard unless you're, unless you're not using a sidebar, for example. Your sidebar is another uh, 200 and something pixels. If you're not using a sidebar, for example, and you have an image that stretches across the entire content area, then you could simply look at that image and check out the dimensions of the image. You can see that this header image here is 940 pixels wide. So from here to here is 940 pixels in, in total. Obviously, you know, then again, you have your, your paddings and your margins you have to worry about and sidebars. Um, so the, you know, the answer can really vary from one site to the next, but hopefully that should give you a way to at least be able to quickly figure out a, a rough estimate of how much space you have available to work with. You're welcome, Stan. Um, okay, now I'm going to be uh, setting a, uh, a position on this particular one. Now, the, the easiest way that I can explain um, positioning is especially using uh, one of the possible values for the position command, which is the fixed position. Um, you should all be familiar with uh, this little bar that's up here at the top of your WordPress sites. Now, if you have a lot of content on your page, like if you're in your administration area here and you're scrolling down the page, you can see that this a uh, bar actually stays with you on the page and never moves no matter what you're doing on the page, how far you have scrolled down, etc. So this is accomplished by using the position command and also using the fixed value that goes along with that position command. So when you set an element with a fixed position, um, I'll go ahead and do this on this particular element here. <clears throat> the next thing that you need to do is specify two other CSS commands. One is called left and one is called top. And these commands are telling the browser um, where you want your element to get displayed. Now, if you're using a fixed position, you are referencing a point within your entire browser window starting with the upper left hand corner and this upper left hand corner right here is going to be this position right here left of zero pixels and top of zero pixels so this uh, administration bar up here is actually uh, set with this type of CSS coding on it to make it always stick up there at the top of the page. Now, uh, WordPress actually has, um, you know, done their done their homework in terms of the CSS that goes along with this bar. So it's actually very difficult to try to get something to sit on top of it because obviously that is not something that they would want to happen because they want it to always be on top. So if I were to run this particular um, bit of C, bit of uh, HTML and CSS code and show it to you on the live site, you actually wouldn't end up noticing anything because this text would actually end up getting hidden behind the administration bar. So just to show you how this actually works, I am going to uh, 
change the top value to 100 pixels instead of 0 pixels. Now, when I go back and refresh my page, you can see that here is my content over here. It's not even in my web page at all. It's, it's completely outside of all of my normal content, and it's located uh, zero pixels away from the left-hand side of the page, and it's 100 pixels down from the top of the page. And if I actually had a longer page here, I could scroll down to other content at the bottom of this page, and this text right here will never move. This will always sit right there on my web page, no matter what I'm looking at or how far I've scrolled. Um, now, another way that you can use uh, this position command, instead of forcing it to break outside of your normal website, you can actually use it um, within your website to uh, simply change the, the normal behavior of uh, your content. So what I'm going to do here is create a second um, div tag, and this one is actually going to be located inside of the first div tag. And then I'm going to assign a position to it. And uh, I'll explain this here to you guys in just a second. Um, so now instead of using the fixed position like I was doing before, uh, this time I am using a combination of the other two uh, commonly used values with this position command. Now to start with my first uh, parent element here, I have set a position of relative uh, on this element. And what relative means is that it is basically looking at where this element should normally show up on your web page. And then you are assigning a new location to it relative to where it should have normally shown up on your page. So I am telling this element to show up 100 pixels to the right of where it should normally have shown up on my page. Now, this second element that I have added inside of it, I have assigned a position of absolute to this element. Now, what absolute is telling it is that the position that I am declaring for it right here is going to be set uh, according to the location of the parent element that is set uh, with a non-static position. Now what I mean by static is static is actually the default value for this position command. Any normal HTML elements that you build on your page are going to be static elements. So to use the absolute value, you need to have a parent element that is not a static element to be able to use this properly. So by setting the absolute position to this and telling it uh, to show up 100 pixels to the left, notice I used a negative symbol here. Um, you only have the commands top and left, so if you want to go to the right, it's adding pixels, and if you want to go to the left, it's taking away pixels and even if it runs you into the negative numbers, because this is not a uh, location based on my entire window size, it is a location based on the parent element's location. So when I, when I update the changes on this and refresh my web page, you can see that uh, content number two is actually showing up to the left of content number one even though in my page code here, content number one was first and content number two was second. The reason why this is happening is because content number one was pushed to the right 100 pixels. Now, content number two 
is being pushed to the left 100 pixels. But this location is dependent upon the location of the first element. So it's actually pushing this content back to the original location of this content before it was moved. So this is essentially making the content trade places with each other. Um, now there are uh, a lot of different uh, ways that you could use uh, these particular commands. Um, Typically, they're used for you know things like this administration bar, where you need to force something to uh, display in a particular spot on your page. Uh, but you maybe you couldn't ordinarily uh, force that content to show up there. So this is one way of accomplishing that. Um, obviously, there might not be much of a need to simply switch positions of your content, for example. But if you wanted to add something, uh, text to a part of your site, and maybe you didn't know how to edit it, let's say this little blank spot right up here. What if I wanted to add some text into this blank spot right here? This would be done using uh, positioning. I could take this one element right here, and I could uh, simply estimate how much I would need to adjust this element to get it to show up in this portion of my page. Uh, I would probably estimate this at about 400, 450 pixels up and um, maybe 700 to the right. So I will set this at 700 left and a top value of negative uh, 450 pixels. And then I will update this and refresh my page. I think I missed it. I think it's behind the image file right here. Um, but as you can see, like, uh, all you have to do is just simply, you know, you play around with your numbers and you could, you could move text to show up wherever you want it to. I'd be willing to bet that it's sitting behind the image right now. Either that or I've gone too far up off the page. Um, anyways, it doesn't matter. The, the, uh, the point is just to show that the, the position command is used to move elements around your page in a manner that it wouldn't normally uh, be possible to do um, by just using standard HTML coding, for example. Um, now to, to go a little bit beyond this, um, I want to talk about a, a couple of commands that can be used with, uh, with these, uh, particular div tags. Um, really they can be used with, with any HTML tags, but I find myself using them most commonly with div tags, and those would be, uh, the commands of margin and padding. Margin is creating a uh, white space outside of your element, and this is set with pixels. And the padding is creating white space within your element, and this is also set with pixels. Now, I'm gonna set a border on this element so you can actually see how this will end up looking. I will update the changes on my page and refresh them. So you can see that this has created uh, this 250 by 250 pixel squared box for me with a border around it. Um, except that there is a uh, padding and margin space. The padding is between the border and your content, and then the margin space is outside of your border. Now, when you're adding margin and padding like this, it is adding it to all four sides of this particular element. 
So now if I if I duplicate this element and uh, change, I will change like we'll change the padding here to a significantly larger number, um, just so you can see how this makes a difference. When I refresh the changes, you can see that there is considerably more white space in between the border and the content than there was uh, for this example up here. So margins and padding can be used to help you um, get your text to show up exactly where you want it to be, especially if you're using your HTML tags and adding some kind of design to them. You typically don't want your content butting up right up against your border, you usually want a little bit of space in between there. So um, the padding command helps you create that space and then the margin command helps you separate your tags from other tags. Um, otherwise, uh, like your div tags, for example, they will sit directly right up against each other um, if, you're, if you're not doing this. Now, to go to go a little bit further with um, everything that I have that I have been showing you guys here, um, I'm going to remove the margins and the paddings from these particular elements, and I'm going to um, actually I don't need these float commands. Um, I'm going to go back and show one more example with uh, positioning for you guys and actually include a new command um, for you called zindex. And what zindex does is it actually declares the uh, order that your elements get layered on the page. If you remember um, a few minutes ago, like when I was trying to get the content to display up here, for example, and I was pretty sure it was showing up behind this image file, um, you can actually change the order that things are getting displayed with the zindex command. And uh, I guess the only problem with using this with, with elements that maybe you didn't create yourself, like for example, this image file, I have no idea what the zindex might be set for. Uh, for this particular element, but when you're when you're doing this with elements that you have created entirely on your own, um, you can you can easily set the order that they are stacked on your page. Now, uh, to start with, I'm going to create a um, a placeholder tag here that is going to set um, enough height that I need to uh, accomplish what I am looking to do with this particular example. Um, and uh, I can show you why I had to do this in just a few minutes once I finish with this example. Um, so what I'm going to do is this first div tag, I want to set this um, to a relative position and I'm not going to actually alter where it is getting displayed. All I am doing is telling it to become a relative positioned element instead of being a static positioned element. And then I'm going to set a Z index value of 10 on it. Now down here on the second element that I have, I'm going to set a position of absolute. You remember this is the uh, example I was giving you before of using relative and absolute together to be able to change the way things are typically displayed. So now this time around, I'm going to tell it to move 50 pixels to the left and, or sorry, to the right, and I'm going to tell it to move 50 pixels down. So I use a left 50 pixels and a top 50 pixels values on that and this time I'm going to set a Z index value of 20. Now this is um, 
telling the coding that I want the second element to show up on top of the first element because the Z index number is larger. It will start with the smallest Z index numbers and work its way up to the largest Z index numbers. Um, now, I need to, uh, I need for this other element here to actually be inside of the first one. As you can see here, I have my second div tag, and then my first div tag is actually containing the second one. Um, and then my container div tag right here is surrounding all of this. Um, now, just so you actually get to see how this looks on the page, um, and so these windows are not showing through each other, I'm going to set a background color on both of these as well before um, I actually show this to you guys. So now, when I, when I save my changes here and refresh my page, you'll get to see that my two boxes that I've created actually show up on top of each other now in, in like a cascading uh, type of design. And there's, there's really no other way to create uh, this type of look on your web page unless you just create uh, an image file, for example, that does all this together. But even then, you're not going to be able to easily edit your content within your image file. So this is actually a way that you can create something that might appear as though it was created uh, using graphics, for example, but it's all nothing but HTML and CSS coding. Um, so you could really create some, you know, different looking websites using using uh, these types of techniques. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, proceed on to the next part. I've still got a fairly decent amount uh, to try to cover here, and uh, I've only got about 30 minutes or so left. That should be plenty of time and even have some time after that. I'll let you guys ask some questions if you happen to have any. Um, now, I, uh, I've already used this a couple of times before, uh, the border command, um, but I want to explain this in a little more detail now um, in terms of how it can actually be used. Uh, obviously, you're using the CSS command border but then the value that is going uh, with this CS command is actually a three-part value. You have the size first of your border, and this determines um, in pixels how, how wide the line should be that is uh, drawing your border. Now, the second value um, is actually a, a value, a keyword phrase for one of the predefined uh, border types that you can use with CSS. Now, I made, I made another list of these for you guys um, on, uh, in the guidebook. Um, one of the most common ones that I use is solid. Solid is just creating a single solid uninterrupted line as your border, but there are other possibilities that you can use, um, like having a dotted line or a dashed line or double lines, or there's even uh, some uh, 3D options that you could be using for your borders here. So I've provided all the different values for you guys. You can try those out on your own and, and see what they each look like. Um, and, and, you know, you can really create a wide variety of, of looks with just this one command. Now, the, the last part of this command here is a hex color code. Now, if you don't remember me talking about hex color codes before, this uh, starts with a number symbol and is followed by a series of six letters and or numbers. And all this is is it represents a specific color. Now, I actually use um, a site called Color Picker to uh, 
easily select the colors that I want to be able to use on my site. You can drag your cursor around here. You can change over here on the right hand side uh, the colors that are being displayed. So you know if you wanted to pick a green color you slide it down here. You find the correct shade of green that you want to use and then when you're satisfied with the color uh, your hex color code is right up here in this box. You simply copy this six letters and numbers and uh, paste it in wherever you're wanting to use it as a color on your site. It could be used for border colors, it could be used for text colors, or it could be used uh, for background colors even. Um, the uh, I guess the uh, the next part here that I've already entered in for this one particular example um, that I have not discussed in more in more detail. Oh wait a second. Um, before I before I do that, just one more thing uh, with the borders. Um, this command is going to create a border on all four sides of your element, just like margin or padding would do. Um, but you can actually use these commands. Uh, to only apply to one specific side of your element. And you do that by simply adding in an, a, uh, a hyphen and an extra keyword phrase um, that relates to the side that you want to use. So for example, if I wanted my border to only be on the top of the element, I add a hyphen and the word top. Uh, you can use the words left, right, or bottom or top right there. Um, and that works for borders, margins, and padding. Uh, they all work in the same way. You add that extra little phrase onto the end and then you can make it only apply to one particular side instead of to all the sides. So using this you could actually create an element that had um, borders that were different on different sides of the element. You could use this to help to, to make um, the element stand out on your page a little bit more to make it look not as flat, you know, give it some depth and, and texture to it. Um, or you could also just use this, uh, you know, to, to help enhance your, your designs that you are working on on your sites. Um, now, now the other command here that I've already entered in for this previous example is the background color command. This works um, just like uh, setting a text color, for example, using the color command. Uh, all you have to do is provide a value of a hex color code, which you know I explained how to uh, get those just a minute ago for you guys. So you can set background colors on your elements, uh, whatever color you want to use, by just finding the color code for it and using the background color um, CSS command. Now a lot of people are curious about how how instead of using a solid background color for example how could you actually load up your own customized uh, image file and use it as your background color in, uh, instead. Um, now this is done with just the background command. Now, I've gone into uh, a pretty decent amount of detail in the guidebook about how to use this background command because there are uh, a lot of different ways that it can be used and the command can actually accept a total of eight different um, values from other background commands. For example, this is a background command, my background color command. This is simply used to set the color. But this uh, value can actually be used in the background command as well. Now, so I've, I've gone through and explained, uh, I listed all the different, um, the eight commands that are part of this one command. And I've, I've used one particular example of it to generate a background image. Um, and I've used uh, five of 
the possible eight commands to accomplish this. Now the first one that I'm using is the background color. Now you might wonder why am I setting a background color if I am setting an image for my background. Just like with the list markers, if the image doesn't load for some reason, uh, you actually have a small percentage of internet users out there uh, that have images disabled in their browser, so they won't actually download the images when they come to your website. So you can use the color as a, as a fallback for your background image. Now the next part that I'm going to add is using uh, the background image command value. I could simply use the command background image and set a URL for it, but I wouldn't be able to change the uh, default values of those other background commands. So that is the reason why this one single background command is used instead of using a series of different background commands because now I can just set everything that I need to set uh, with one declaration here. So now with the, uh, the URL, I, uh, I set a value of URL, I use an open parentheses and a single quote mark, and then I add in the complete website address of a file um, that I want to use as my image file um, for the background for this particular element. So now I've already loaded one up on my site to use for this example and I'm going to punch the um, URL in here. Um, now the now the next um, the next value that I'm using with this particular command uh, is the background repeat command value. Uh, for this particular example, I want to set this to no repeat. This is simply telling CSS with it, when it displays this image as the background image that I don't want it to repeat the image. I just want it displayed one time on the page and that's it. You can actually create uh, what's known as like a tiled background, for example, a background that could be repeated uh, horizontally and or vertically. And you can set repeat values like just repeat to make it repeat both uh, directions, or you can use repeat X or repeat Y to make the image only repeat in one particular direction. Um, but for this example, uh, I'm just using a solid image file that I want to display as it already is, so I am using the no repeat uh, value for this command. Now the, the next command value here is the background attachment. Now a background attachment is actually referring to whether the background is uh, attached to elements on my page or whether it is uh, fixed within my entire window, for example. If you've ever gone to a website that uses a background image, for example, and as you scroll down the web page, the background image never actually moves, it doesn't scroll with the rest of the page, this was accomplished using the background attachment uh, command and setting it to a value of fixed. Um, for this particular example though, I just want to use the default value of scroll. Now because I'm using the default value technically, I don't even have to use it because it will automatically get set like this. However. I wanted to go ahead and include it as part of this tutorial because there are some instances where people might not want to use this default value, for example. Um, now the last uh, command here, as part of my background command that I'm setting the value for, is the background position command. Now what this is doing, it is, it is telling um, where within the element to start displaying 
uh, my background image. It could start it from the top left hand corner of the element and display it. It could start it from the center and display it. Um, it really doesn't matter just you know as long as your um, as long as your image will line up correctly with with what you are looking to do. I'm going to go ahead and um, update the changes to this now so you can see this working on my live web page here. Now as you can see uh, my background image is actually a little posty note uh, and it is displaying the image here as my background and then my content is laid on top of it and so you know you could use a background image and instead of creating images with text already built into them if you find that you would use the same uh, background image part of it over and over again and just want different text on top of it this is one particular way that you can add images to your page um, except you're not actually adding them using HTML tags you're just adding them using CSS coding um, now as you can see like I have a border still set on this uh, which is why the black border is being displayed uh, there out around everything um, but if I if I remove the border and um, align my text to the center of the element for example and then maybe um, maybe I'll add a, a top padding uh, to my element of say 50 pixels and uh, and then we'll change the uh, the font size and the font weight to make it stand out a little bit more. So just to show you a slightly more practical example of how this could be used, for example, you can see that uh, I have enlarged my content here, and um, you know I've removed my border. Why is this gray? Oh, I know why that's there. The gray background is being displayed um, because it was the default background that I was using and um, my particular image file is being set to no repeat and this image file is exactly 250 by 250 pixels. Um, the problem here occurred when uh, I set this padding. So what I could actually do here I can still leave this background color in and I could change the height of this element to only be 200 pixels now instead of 250. Now this is this is another good example of using background images because as you can see my entire background image is still getting displayed here even though I changed the size of my element to actually be shorter than the background image was. Now the reason why this is happening is because of my padding. Background images will always display um, in your padding space. If you don't want, if you need extra space and you don't want the background image to be taking up that space, then you need to use margins or um, you might need to create a parent uh, div tag to go around this div tag to create that extra spacing. Um, so this particular element, it's 200 pixels tall, but then there's 50 pixels of padding at the top of it here. So that gives it a total height of 250 pixels and a total width of 250 pixels. Um, so as you can see, that allows it to display on my page uh, correctly as it was intended to be displayed. No borders, my content is you know, laying on top of my image and I can easily go in at any time and edit this content. I could turn it into a link, um, you know, the uh, possibilities are really limitless here with with what you can do with um, 
with this type of uh, CSS coding. Now, just to go slightly further with um, this background command right here, you notice that I used uh, the background position value here of center. Typically, um, this particular command actually has a two-part value to it. The only reason why I have only included a one-part value here is because uh, when you omit a value, it defaults to center. So I actually could have left, uh, well, if, if I had omitted this value, it defaults to the top left corner. So I set it to center. Um, however, I don't have to use two center commands. Now, the reason why there are two commands is uh, so you can uh, identify a specific side or part of your page or your element where uh, the image should get displayed. For example, if you wanted your image to start displaying in the top right-hand corner of uh, the element that you are working on, instead of using the value of center here, you would use a value of right top. Um, now this actually looks like two different values here, uh, but these go together and uh, CSS can interpret this correctly. Now instead of using a, a, a keyword command for this value right here to indicate how you want this um, background to be positioned, um, you can actually set a, uh, a unit of measurement for this instead. Um, this could be done in like pixels uh, like I have used for my other examples or it could also be done in percentages. Um, for example, the top left hand corner um, of your element that you are working on uh, could be represented with either uh, 0% and 0% or it could also be represented as 0 pixels and 0 pixels or I could actually do 0 pixels and 0% because you can mix and match these together. Now the reason why these are uh, good to know about is let's say for example um, Let's say I want to set the background image right here for this particular element, but let's say maybe maybe my element uh, would end up being a different size from my background image. Um, if my background image is smaller than my element size, then I can use this positioning right here to um, tell the website exactly where I want that to get displayed. Um, now this ends up being helpful because um, if, if, for example, here I'll show you a practical example of this right here. I'm going to remove the background default color and I'm going to change the height of my element to be 300 pixels and I'm going to leave this set to centered <clears throat> as I had it before. Now when I refresh my changes you can see that it actually uh, altered where my image was getting displayed in relation to my content. My content is no longer down here uh, in the image where it was before, it's sitting right up against the top of it. And that is happening because uh, it is being displayed from the center. So now what I could do, for example, is set a value of center top uh, to this element and refresh the changes. And as you can see now, the image is actually displaying at the top of my element um, and centered um, within the horizontal content of my element. So 
doing it this way, there's actually still um, room in the element down below my image file. And I can show you this extra space existing by adding a border to my element. So as you can see, my image is aligned at the top of my element space, and there's actually extra space down here at the bottom uh, of the element where there is not an image covering it. So uh, there are a lot of instances where you may find that your element size is larger than the image that you want uh, to use with it. For example, maybe you don't want the image to take up the whole element size or even be behind your content. You might just want your image to kind of be an icon. Um, if you've used any of my any of my uh, WordPress plugins before, for example, the uh, the buttons within the administration areas that have a little icon uh, to the left of the text on the button. Those are background images set with CSS coding, and I will simply align them vertically uh, to center, and but then I'll force it to show up on the left-hand side of the element, for example. So all of this is done with these last two little values right here by giving it a keyword or uh, a pixel amount or a percentage amount. Um, center top, for example, would uh, be the same thing as saying 50% and 0%. See if I refresh the changes here. Uh, it doesn't actually do anything because those values are identical. Um, so you can use either the keywords or the percentages, but the, the percentages and the pixels allow you to do increments um, in between those keyword-based values, um, which you could not ordinarily do without using a percent or a pixel value, for example. Um, I, I believe that is about all for this evening. Uh, does anybody have questions on anything I've talked about uh, tonight so far, or even even on uh, previous training sessions, if you've been working on something from last week, for example, maybe that you have some questions about, um, you know, feel free to uh, to ask those questions as well. I don't I don't mind doing a little bit of backtracking for you guys, um, especially if you're working with these concepts um, after each of the training sessions, for example. Um, so you know, feel feel free to ask anything that you that you might be wondering right now. Um, if not, my uh, my next training session for you guys will be uh, next week. Uh, next week it will actually be on Wednesday night and not Tuesday night. Um, it will still be at 7 p.m. though um, for the next two weeks. Uh, they will both be on Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. Uh, until approximately 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Thank you, Stan. I'll see you next week, too. Anybody have questions tonight, guys? I don't think I've had any questions tonight. Did I, did I do a good job of explaining it? Is that why you don't have questions, or... Uh, let's see, George George has a question about my Amazon site building class. Um, thank you, Clive. Have a good night. See you next week. Um, George, my, uh, my Amazon site building class is going to be starting, um, I believe the exact date of the first training session for that is on August the 8th, um, and then each of the uh, following sessions for that will be, I believe I set them each up at six days 
after uh, the previous um, training session. So, uh, you know, the next one, I think that would make it on like August the 14th. And um, so, you know, they'll be, they'll be every six days or so starting from August the 8th. And that's, they're basically starting then because I don't want, I don't want those uh, training sessions to be overlapping with uh, these training sessions, for example. Um, and so the, the Amazon uh, training program that I will be running will actually be starting uh, after this uh, Techie Masterclass is completely over. Let's see. Um, you're welcome, George. I could uh, I go to my page here for this and double check. Okay, I'm sorry. It is it is August the ninth and not August the eighth for uh, the very first one in that next session. And then now that, that is a uh, Friday, August the ninth. And then so the with them set six days apart, um, each uh, day of the week of the next one will actually be one day earlier in the week. So these should end up being on all different days of the week. Um, this one's on Friday. The next one's on Thursday, Wednesday, Tuesday, Monday. And I'm even going to be running this next session uh, over the weekends. You can see once you get down to number six, uh, number six will be on a Sunday night. Number seven will be on a Saturday night. So um, the Amazon series will actually be taking place um, all seven days of the week uh, and repeating almost completely around to a second week. Yes, there will be uh, one Saturday and one Sunday session. And then a total of 10 sessions that will all be during during the week. Uh, does anybody have any additional questions for me tonight, guys? Anything on CSS or even anything on uh, control panel or HTML even? Um, if not, next week is going to be on PHP programming. Um, it will probably be uh, one of my longer sessions, I would imagine, because uh, PHP pro programming can, can definitely be a little um, more difficult to understand for, for beginners than uh, HTML and CSS, for example. So I'm going to really try to go slow uh, to begin with in that um, so you guys can actually learn. Uh, the basics of PHP, how to use it on your WordPress sites. Um, and then I'm going to go into some uh, practical examples um, of using PHP next week. And we're actually going to do like a, uh, a form processing script, for example, um, and do some work with uh, databases. Uh, will the website building include code writing? Um, I, I do use, uh, a little bit of, um, custom HTML and CSS on my Amazon sites, George. Uh, typically, typically I will not end up using PHP programming on my Amazon sites unless I have a really, really good reason for needing to do so. Um, so there, there will be uh, some HTML and CSS uh, training that comes along with the Amazon, Amazon uh, webinar sessions, um, but that, that code writing will basically be specific uh, examples. Um, for example, I can I could pull up a quick. Uh, example for you real quick here. On a Amazon site that I have made, you can see on the uh, on the home page here, for example, uh, all of these uh, custom designed uh, 
areas right here. This is actually like a kind of a menu system that I will often use on a lot of my websites. And you can see that like if somebody clicks on one of these items here, for example, that it takes them um, to the category page for uh, for this particular uh, category. So in, in that regard, I will be doing some custom HTML and CSS uh, with things like these custom menu items in my page. Um, but any, any instances where I use something like this on my site and I'm teaching that in the training, then I will have uh, example code um, prepared for you guys that you could essentially just copy and paste onto your own websites um, and, and, you know, just modify the... Uh, text or the image files or whatever might be in it. So you you will not actually have to write code from scratch. Um, but I will be teaching some coding uh, in, in those sessions. You're welcome, George. Feel free to let me know if you uh, have any other questions or if anybody else out there has questions. Looks like a couple of you guys are uh, Still sticking around. If you have anything to ask, feel free to feel free to ask away. I'll um, hang out for a few more minutes uh, just to make sure that I've got everything answered for you guys. And uh, if not, then we will we will be uh, meeting up next next Wednesday. Thank you, George. See you next week. Have a good week.